Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 370 for Friday, October 26, 2018. Joshua Gans. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a new home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation. This is a show where every week we talk to some of the most interesting people working in tech or writing about tech. And today I am honored to talk to Joshua Gans. He is a Stanford grad and professor of strategic management at the Rotman School of Management. He's the author of several books, including The Disruption Dilemma, Information Wants to be Shared, and parentonomics, and but today we're talking about his newest book, Prediction Machines, The Simple Economics of Artificial Intelligence. Thanks for coming on, Joshua. Oh, it's good to be here, thanks. Uh, so what makes an economist's look at AI different than a business manager or uh, another kind of scientist? Well, I think economists have a way, uh, I guess, of stripping something down. Uh, We're not big on the hype. We're not uh, that interested in uh, uh, pushing things uh, uh, and overselling them. And so we try to work out what what things really are. Uh, And basically, when it comes to something like artificial intelligence, uh, what that means is uh, thinking, what does this new technology really do? And can I relate it to something that I, as an economist, really care about, like cost? And that's basically the perspective we give. And so I know part of this is is hype. Um, but when a lot of people talk about AI now, they're they're like, oh, is, do you want Skynet? This is how you get Skynet. And, um, you know, robot apocalypse. I'm as guilty as any about talking about it. But I, I think when often when we talk the in those terms, we're ignoring um, what's really happening, the the smaller things, the way that AI is really changing things. So talk a little bit about the way AI is is changing businesses or has changed businesses um, already. Yeah, I I mean, I like to talk about uh, uh, Terminator and Skynet as well. That's much more fun. (laughs) (laughs) And the day-to-day reality. Uh, I mean, the way that, you know, compare... Compared to the sort of robot apocalypse, what we've really got now is an improvement in statistics. Now, it's a big improvement, but it's an improvement in statistics. And as we've titled our book, Prediction Machines, what it's enabling people to do is use a much larger corpus of data uh, in order to get predictions about things we you know, didn't think were possible uh, to predict. And that's what the artificial intelligence is doing. Prediction's an important part of so many decisions that uh, we make. Uh, We use it all the time without really thinking about it. Uh, You know, it's not just uh, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, what are we going to wear today and what the weather's going to be like, which is an obvious uh, way one might use prediction. But also just in, you know, when you uh, are catching a ball or something like that, you are using prediction to work out the trajectory of the object. Uh, and also when you're driving a car, you're using prediction to work out, you know, not ju- where everything is. Uh, you don't necessarily have a, a fully clear map in your head. You're taking inputs and you're working out what to do. So where prediction is being where where these new uh, machine learning tools and AI are being used now uh, is uh, to predict things uh, that we've been predicting before. So a lot of businesses are taking the data that they have and are saying, well, how can I use this to predict some important things about you know forecast my sales and things like that uh there are technology companies that are of course using it in new domains so you will have google being using prediction uh, and facebook and others using prediction to identify uh what's in a photo uh now what they're what they're they're not really identifying it what they're doing is predicting what would a human call the thing in a photo 
and sometimes when they get better still, uh, they're able to uh, attach those labels where even people can't see what the thing in the photo is, such as trying to diagnose whether a tumor is malignant or not, as in the case of sort of radiology. So those are the kind of things that uh, are currently being done uh, with uh, artificial intelligence, and we're seeing some of the effects of that. Uh, the really interesting thing is, what, what is this going to open up in the future? And so for the radiologist, you, you talk about that, that example in the book, um, the radiologist still has a job. So if the job, if, if, the, if the AI is, is better at predicting whether something um, is, is malignant or not, what, what, what then is the radiologist's job in that situation? And then going forward as it, the AI gets better and better, what's the radiologist's job? Right. It's very, I mean, um, uh, Jeff Hinton, who was one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence a few years ago, uh, basically looked at this situation and said, well, why are we even training radiologists now? Uh, you know, even if we can't today uh, uh, identify what radiologists can do by looking at an image, surely, you know, in a very short period of time, that's going to be possible. Now, uh, that's one way to look at it. And I I have, uh, you know, seen this sort of reaction uh, all over the shop. It's like, isn't my job all this? Uh, isn't just going to replace me entirely? Well, what happens is when you give these tools to radiologists, and they're the first ones to use it, by the way, uh, they find more things. Uh, they find that, yes, the tool can uh, tell you that there's a tumor or, or not. Occasionally, it can tell it with high degree of ac accuracy. But there are other times at which the even the tool comes back with something a bit more nuanced, such as there's a 60% chance that this is malignant. Uh, and now that is a very different situation because then you have to think and start weighing up well, what does that 60% mean? Does it mean I should do a biopsy on a patient? Well, that depends on the patient, right? That depends on is the patient, uh, you know, young versus old? Uh, what's their other current state of health? All sorts of other factors as well. Now, those are uh, uh, factors that, you know, doctors in conjunction with radiologists take into account. But radiologists, because, you know, they are seeing these things right there on the front line, are going to start taking some of those judgments themselves, start getting experience in it. And this is nothing new. Uh, for the last 50 years, radiologists have realized that there are all manner of tools that have been Im impacting on their jobs. Uh, you know, they're one of the more disruptive professions that there is. And they've adapted and adapted ever, ever since. So even if uh, it may be the case that, you know, 80% of what a radiologist currently does uh, gets done by a machine. It turns out, you know, like many professions, there's a lot more to do. There's a lot more you can be spending your time on. And when you're given more precise and more accurate information, which is essentially what these prediction machines are doing, you will learn how to use that. You'll learn how to apply your judgment to that and it'll make you valuable, more valuable still. So you, you also talk about Daniel Kahneman's work a lot, um, and he, the author of uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, and many other right. books, but I think that's the that's the most that's the one that regular non economists read. <laughs> um, and he talks about how his humans uh, were not always good at looking at numbers accurately. Like you use the example of if you uh, if you tell someone that uh, that a certain treatment has ninety percent success success, even if you tell a doctor that, versus saying it has a ten percent mortality rate, they're going to think differently about it, even though that's the same thing. Um, right. So, so are, are though, I mean, is that, uh, obviously an AI is really good at that. So what kind of um, jobs will be replaced, um, not just radiologists or, I mean, we're not going to replace a, a doctor's job, but, but how does the AI fit in there and help? Because you know, what, what are we good at in humans if we can't, you know, see numbers like that and understand that they're the same? So we are terrible at that. <laughs> uh, objectively terrible. Uh, people like Danny Kahneman have measured this for, for decades and have cleverly shown uh, how bad we are. Uh, and nothing that doesn't change, of course, with AI, because really uh, AI, uh, they're no better 
um, at interpreting those numbers. You mentioned that one study where if you state it as a probability of survival versus a probability of 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 death, your the doctor. Uh, the doctor's answers change. The question is, which of those ones is the correct one? <laughs> which of those ones is the correct treatment? Um, because I've decided to treat differently based on these different frames. So someone has to determine that. Someone has to determine which is the right way to go and then uh, have to educate all the doctors or alternatively code it in if you want to trust an AI, uh, a computer to take that information and tell you what the treatment is going to be. So what's really interesting here is, you know, there are cases in which uh, because of prediction machines, we're going to be able to do a lot better because humans aren't that great at prediction. But in taking that information and using it, we still have a long way to go. Uh, and, you know, the current techniques aren't going to solve that. Now, people like Danny Kahneman say, well, we'll solve that eventually and we'll program machines to do that or the machines will work out, some, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a new technique that, that works out how to do that. And so he is not very optimistic uh, about humans having any such role <laughs> into the future. Uh, and, and, you know, I guess he has been on the front line of that. But I can see that there's still a long way to go even with all of our foibles, uh, to to work out what the right thing to do is, to have us trust it, uh, to have us feel that we're not missing something else uh, when information is presented one way or another uh, that might be triggering some other things that we are yet to understand. And so I think there's just more, more to do there. Uh, so I, I, you know, the, on the one hand, I agree with the assessment. We seem to be uh, you know, cr you know, poor decision makers, uh, almost random, uh, if you want. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's not clear what to how to improve on that situation just yet. So, so you you talk about how, how as the value of human prediction goes declines, that means the value of human judgment and action uh, will go up. The, what does that look like? I mean, what does what does that look like in in the workplace when uh, human judgment um, and and uh, is is more valuable? Can you give right, some examples? Right. Well, let, let me give you an example. It's hard to it's sometimes hard to do it quite in the workplace, but the the example we talk about in the book is your decision whether to carry an umbrella or not when you leave the house. Uh, you know, in without a prediction of the weather, uh, that decision, it depends on your uh, concerns about getting wet versus not, okay? So if you're like me, I don't like to get wet. I'm, I, I don't mind carrying an umbrella. So if I didn't have any prediction at all, what I would do is always carry the umbrella. I would have that as my rule. Uh, now, give me a prediction, however, and I can start making a more nuanced decision. I can start saying, well, if the prediction tells me that there's an, only a 5% uh, chance of rain today, I can uh, think about that situation more. I can say, you know, okay, 5% chance of rain, maybe I shouldn't take my umbrella. Maybe I can save myself uh, that trouble. Uh, and there isn't really very much risk involved in, in that decision. Now, what am I doing there? There's a new situation for me. The prediction now allows me to think about that option and think about what I might do in a more finely grained situation. It's the same way as, let me give you another analogy. You know, when you buy a lottery ticket or something like that, um, people spend a lot of time uh, thinking about how they'll spend the money if they win. Now, this seems like crazy behavior, obviously, since the probability of winning is so low. But once you've bought the ticket, it's not zero anymore. And so you can now entertain that uh, prospect. You can now think about those things. So take this now to a more complicated set of decisions where you're suddenly getting more information that is basically saying, you know, you may have been following a rule. Uh, you may have insulated yourself against the fact of uncertainty. You may not be avoiding all sorts of decisions just because they're too risky for you. Uh, 
But now that you've got a prediction, the risk has gone down and you now can start to think about, well, is it a good idea to take that decision now? Maybe I should take that risk. What's involved in taking that risk? What are the payoffs associated with it? Um, I can de-risk now. It doesn't mean it's necessarily a good idea, but I will now think about that. And that's what we call human judgment, trying to think about those additional options and think about what you'd do with the time. Um, Just to finally take one more example, you know, now that we have good ways of predicting how long it's going to take us to get to the airport or something like that, um, we can now entertain the possibility of not spending, uh, you know, an, an extra hour at the airport most times because we're worried about missing a flight. We can instead, you know, wake up a little later, uh, think about what we'll do with that time, uh, you know, uh, and and reallocate our time because we now have a more precise estimate of, you know, what time we need to leave uh, to be to be at the airport two hours ahead of the plane leaving. Yeah, that was something I'd never thought about. Just the fact that airport lounges might be the the places that disappear because AI gets better. Right. (laughs) Um, I want to read this quote that's in the line. uh, It's a... Uh, uh, Steve jo- in, in 2007, when Steve Jobs paced the stage and introduced the iPhone to the world, not a single observer reacted by saying, well, it's curtains for the taxi industry, um, which I thought was really l- along the lines of, 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 you know, who would think that airport lounges would, would, would disappear? Um, right. You know, no one thought that, you know, that, that taxi drivers were at risk. So is there any way, I mean, as an economist, can you sort of um, predict other jobs that are likely to disappear or that um, people might uh, not uh, do well to to get into that line of field line of work at this point uh, you know I wish <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, we had enough trouble coming up with the uh, airport lounge example for the book uh, and thinking about uh, things like that. Um, and I think the real takeaway is, you know, this is a radical innovation. And, you know, if you look back at the last one in recent memory, which was, of course, the uh, Internet, you know, two and a half decades ago, um, people had real trouble seeing what that was going to the changes that was going to uh, give even when they saw what the technology was even though they saw that now we have free worldwide communication and we'll be able to move data across and things like that um there was a lot of uh surprise uh at just how transformative that man- that 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 were that was uh and there was a lot of skepticism at the time as to whether it was really going to be uh a big thing. It was really going to change things. You know, people said, well, you know, for instance, you and I are talking at the moment over the internet, over effectively a video phone. You know, they'd experimented with video phones 30 years ago and no one wanted to use them. Um, But, you know, uh, uh, with the internet, it was just easier to use. It was a lower cost it was um, a situation where we have much better cameras that we do now. And so I guess people look better or look worse, as the case may be. I don't know. But, you know, these are these are things uh, that we just did not anticipate uh, being able to do. Uh, and, and, you know, same as when we, you know, we got rollout of mobile phones. We, we really didn't understand what sort of transformation that might be uh, giving our, our lives, how that might be changing things. I, you know, I look at uh, my teenagers uh, growing up with mobile phones and, you know, I can see that the mobile phone uh, has substituted for their desire to learn to drive. Mm. And, and it's not because of Uber, although that's a, that's a help. Um, it's because uh, when we were growing up, wanting to drive was our, bil- our, our ticket to independence our independence from our parents, our being able to communicate with our friends and things like that. Well, now we've given every teenager the ability to just do that <laughs> and they can do it en masse. They don't have to predict that everybody's going to be at the mall or something like that in order for that to happen. So these are the unintended consequences of, of radical technologies. And when you think about uh, artificial intelligence as being a change in prediction, and then you start to think about all the uncertainty that there is and all the waste that goes because of that uncertainty. You start to pinpoint situations where uh, we could have big transformations. Just let me give you one example, Um, and it's only because I look at these things uh, now through this lens that I, I see it. 
An industry where there's a huge amount of uncertainty and a huge amount of waste is fashion. Fashion's a complete, utter disaster. Near as I can tell, uh, people who are manufacturing clothes and designing clothes have to do it a year out. They have to anticipate what trends are going to be, what colors are going to be in, what people are going to be comfortable wearing, what the uh, rival manufacturers of clothing are going to be doing. And then they have to produce it. And then they're going to put it in stores. And people are going to go there and maybe they're going to like it, maybe they're not. But the anticipate, the good outcome is that, you know, like 60% of the clothing isn't sold. <laughs> That's the good outcome. A bad outcome is 30%. Um, and just think about all the, the, the waste associated with that. Now, imagine if uh, somebody clever was able to work out how to predict fashion in advance, how to predict what people are going to want to wear in advance. I mean, there are a whole lot of experts trying to do that at the moment, but maybe there's a way of actually doing it uh, uh, that could really change the uh, yields effectively in that industry. Um, and those are the sorts of things that, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to be, uh, you know, fashion might be intrinsically unable to do that. Uh, but there may be industries where, where that will happen. Yeah. I mean, if you think about like the 80s are back now, then, you know, the 90s will, or I guess maybe the 90s are already back. And <laughs> but right, Who knows? Whatever that means. Yes. But it seems to me <laughs> that fashion is the kind of uh, industry where, you know, we're all told what we're supposed to like, like, and then... We, yeah, like although, the, although the people in the fashion industry were, yeah, yeah, no, we are told, we are told, but we don't listen all the time. I mean, they wish they could just tell us, and we would definitely buy it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I, I don't think, I don't, I don't think it's as good as that. And I think they have good and bad seasons in, uh, in that. Um, Burberry just recently, uh, I, I was reading, had to dispose of a whole raft of their inventory because they couldn't they didn't want it to sell it because it would dilute the the brand and things like that so they just destroyed it all because they didn't manage to sell it this year well maybe those cameras that amazon sell for you know you to keep in your closet and recommend outfits that that's they'll collect that data and maybe they'll use I, I you know that's probably on their mind with that i don't know uh, how many people uh, in this age of privacy thought Oh, we've got a problem with privacy. Let's put a let's put a, a camera in people's closets. That seems <laughs> that seems like it was going to be a stretch, but maybe that'll work. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, what about our discomfort with the AI? I mean, I'm thinking. Um, you recently wrote about the Google Duplex, which was the Google's announcement that they were going to use AI to um, help you know, when you called a, a place uh, right. to get reservations. And immediately everyone thought that was up in arms about, um, oh, I don't want to talk to a bot. And they kind of backpedaled and said, well, well, well you would let, we let you know you were talking to a bot. But what do you make, um, I know as an economist, you don't really talk about feelings so much, but <laughs> what do you make of our distrust of AI? I know you talk a little bit about how there's some things that we just appreciate more when a human does it. Um, right. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I think that that was an interesting case. Uh, uh, obviously, people like to be disclosed uh, sort of uh, information around who they're talking to and what that might be meaning. Uh, so that's one part of the comfort. The other part is like, well, how how good does it have to be? Um, you know, people say, well, I wouldn't want to talk to a bot. Well, you know, I, we know that um, because people have been attempting to have us talk to uh, automated uh, message, you know, automated phone calls and things like that for, for, for ages. Uh, but, you know, if it works, uh, people get very comfortable very quickly with it. Um, and, you know, forget the ability just talking on the phone, you know, being able to uh, use a chat bot and effectively text with a bot is probably something people would be, feel very comfortable with quite quickly. And, you know, I, I've seen some uh, startups, there's one called Ada Support, that, you know, noted that in like in interactions between customer support or tech support, you know, 90% of the initial 10, 15 interactions, you know, questions in a, in a, in a call uh, are all the same things and it can be very easily automated. And I think people will quite happily have something automated that saves them from having to wait, that allows a response to be very quick. 
uh, and certain. And, you know, if it gets better, they'll, they'll become comfortable quite quickly with it. I think the bigger and larger concern with these other forms of AI starting to imitate people so well is, of course, the ability to get fooled by it. Uh, you know, you you will think you're talking to a person, uh, you'll end up trusting them like a person, uh, and they're not a person. And that may turn out to have uh, consequences that are, are not great for you. Uh, there are situations at the moment where AI is getting good enough to, you know, I I need not have uh, me, I could be presenting a different face to you here and talking and you wouldn't know the difference. Uh, and so there's the ability to imitate people you know <laughs> and so on. So those sorts of things are going to be, that's what that Google duplex is triggering. That concern that, oh, I could be fooled by this thing. <laughs> I could be fooled by this thing. The Turing test uh, type uh, thing was all about, you know, measuring whether we've got an achievement in intelligence. Uh, but I think the flip side of it is, is deception is basically saying, when is this thing going to be good enough to deceive us? Well, I don't like anything be able to deceive us. So that as a metric is pretty worrying. And so, so the talking about that uh, the automated call, um, just the ones that we have now, where it's a lot of sort of if this, then you right. know. Um, I mean, is that the way you look at like a lot? Can you look at that in, in a broader sense in terms of like that's what our jobs will be? Like you know, it's just predicting if this, then that, then if this, then that, and then until it's sort of like on those calls where it's like if you want to talk to a human press this and right. um, is that what jobs might look like that the computer will do everything until there's a choice that they that the computer can't make and then that's where the human takes over uh, yeah no it could well you know for a call center I, I think that's inevitable uh, I think that's exactly what will happen now for you for working in a call center that becomes a much more interesting job mm -hmm. because uh, you know, you're dealing with the more interesting stuff all the time rather than the road saying the same thing over and over again or trying to convince somebody to buy something or whatever it is. Uh, you know, you, you know, you might only get the, the, the good stuff that way. Uh, and I suspect that will happen in a, in a lot of jobs. But there's this other level to it, which is as these things open up in capabilities, there'll be somebody's job to work out what those if then statements need to look like. Uh, and, you know, as we talked about before, without, you know, the initial prediction, there was no need to think about that. But now we'll start thinking about that and people will start be developing and maybe coding uh, decision making agents uh, that are going to be doing just that. Uh, you know, already we have Alexa skills which are a whole lot of skills that people uh, upload and program into, uh, you know, the Amazon cloud so that it can work on Alexa. Well, all those are just different ways of driving um, uh, interactions with people. Uh, and you have to think through what what that interaction is going to look like and, and stuff like that. So I'm not sure where that's going to lead. I don't know whether we're going to have a job in that or someone's going to decide to develop an AI that's able to do that better than we, <laughs> we can. Uh, those are the sorts of things that are hard to see. Yeah. And, and what about the AI used in, uh, in autonomous cars? I mean, in that... Um is is that following a similar? I know you know we th we think of uh, truck drivers' jobs being right. in danger. You have a good example of of a bus driver. Talk a little bit about that. About a bus yes. driver would still be needed, um, but to do what? Yeah. So I mean, one of the you know uh, autonomous vehicles have caused people to pop around and say, oh well, driving is done. Um, <laughs> and, and you know they've talked about benefits of it. And are we going to uh, you know? Uh, and there's a uh, there's a the argument has shifted from if to when. We still don't know when it's going to be. Uh, believe it or not, you know, some of the leading or companies thought when was going to be next year. I, I think, I think uh, there's no, there's almost no chance. There was no chance of that. Uh, not on public roads anyway. Um, but you know, with respect to you know a school bus driver, well, you know, there is a situation where you want to have a driver who is the safest, most cautious, being able to react to situations. So, you know, if there's a case for having someone who's a better than the average school bus driver, uh, autonomous, uh, having that automated, uh, that's a great use case. 
Okay, so but is that the end for the school bus driver? Well, the thing is, once you start thinking about it, you realize that the school bus driver does a lot more than just driving the bus. The school bus driver is the adult in <laughs> the room then. Because what's the alternative? You say, okay, we're going to have this automated bus and they're going to pick up all these middle school kids and they're going to drive them to school. And you're like, that seems like a terrible idea. That seems like a terrible idea. Why would you ever want to have a whole lot of unsupervised kids in a moving vehicle with an uh, 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 autonomous driver who might get pranked, fooled, confused, whatever, by uh, middle school behavior? And I mean, no AI is ever going to work that out. So you're pretty much saying, oh, no, no, we'll have to have an adult on the bus. And so one can imagine that that adult on the bus is the previous school bus driver who's used to uh, taking care of those uh, kids in that situation, has seen it all, <laughs> has seen all, uh, knows how to discipline kids. And moreover, now we'll be able to do that job without the distraction of driving. Or if you want to put it the other way, we'll now be able to not be distracted driving in order to do that job. Um, and so you can imagine that that's got, that job will evolve uh, and it will evolve in, in potentially interesting ways. Now, will it end up being that uh, the kids might get educated on their way to and from school? I doubt it. <laughs> uh, but something else might occur uh, that way. I mean, you know, for schools that hold a school assembly or a class meeting or a roll call, you do it right then and there. <laughs> Um, so it may save time in other ways. Uh, but the point is, it's very hard to think of actually replacing a person. Um, I know a lot of engineers set that as their goal. How are they going to remove this cost of this person? Uh, but actually what uh, a, dry, a driving uh, AI tells us is that drivers, the th people we call drivers, do a lot more than just driving. Uh, you talk about uh, Bill Gates, um, who wants his idea about wanting to tax uh, companies who have robots um, instead of people. And overall, that might be great for the people who have jobs, but then the companies might have fewer robots and be less efficient and have, um, you know, not do as well uh, in the end. So talk a little bit about that problem. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, you know, Every other interview <laughs> is about, you know, what's this going to mean for the overall jobs? Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, in certain jobs there where, uh, you know, you can imagine prediction being the thing that opens it up so that you can replace a, a person. And I'm sure there are going to be cases like that. Uh, now, from an economist's point of view, uh, the fear seems an odd fear because what we're basically saying is, AI is going to give us a massive shock to productivity, and that's bad. <laughs> that's what the you know that's what I'm filtering and hearing, and you and you reflected that as well. And and so when Bill Gates uh, and others come up and say, well, we should slow that down, or should we should disincentivize that through a tax or something like that, I think what he's thinking of is, okay, we're going to have some unemployed, and we have to think about how to fund them. Uh, from, you know, government purse or something like that to, to, to smooth over those bumps. And economists like doing that. Um, but we just like doing it with taxes that are less distortionary, taxes on consumption or taxes on income, rather than taxes that would, you know, it's, it seems so elegant to have a tax that hits right at the, you know, who seems to be at fault. Uh, you know, some manager or some business somewhere seems to be uh, deciding to replace a w worker with a, a robot. Well, we should get them to to think about that. Um, and in some situations, that's the right way to think. For instance, if you're polluting, <laughs> I want you to think about that and I want you to be taxed on pollution. But with respect to jobs, there's always more stuff to do. Uh, you know, uh, it's not a a tight relationship between one business's decision and the overall number of jobs going on, and so to hit a tax at that point, uh, you know, is 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 inefficient. Um, but you know, the question is, and there's a broader question is, well, how do we smooth over the bumps? You know, what if uh, what if we're all wrong, and all of a sudden uh, some uh, body at, at, at Google or Uber or something develop some little gizmo that costs three dollars, and every 
car in the world can suddenly drive itself <laughs> and it's like a complete no-brainer and you know uh to do what what's going to happen then because really you know uh, uh there'll be a, a lot of drivers that aren't needed anymore uh, uh, right right now as a result of that and so those sorts of situ you know that sort of situation would warrant you know the government thinking about social security the government thinking about you know where is the retraining going to be etc but, you know, I take some comfort in history that we've seen a lot of changes and a lot of big innovations before, and somehow we've coped with them. I mean, no bigger than the substitution of, uh, of labor for capital in the agricultural business. You know, the turn of the century, 70% of people were working in agriculture. We're now down to 2%. Um, and where's the mass unemployment? Where was the big disruption? Now, in certain towns and other things, they had to adjust and things uh, changed over uh, there. But, you know, somehow things managed to cope. And I think ultimately it's if you just think about it in your own lives, you know, what more is there to do? What's more things that I need done or that people could do for me? Uh, uh, and, and, and the list gets pretty darn long. And so I think we find ourselves, uh, you know, in these situations, creating those new uh, tasks and dare I say it, new jobs uh, to make up for the ones that are old. Uh, it seems like a rather miraculous uh, process uh, when, when you sort of look at it in the lens of history, but we've done it before. The only other solace I can take is things are going at the moment much slower than expected <laughs> with respect to AI. It, it's taking them a while. It's, to, it, it's really, really easy to come up with an AI thing that will augment somebody in their current job. It takes a lot of engineering and a lot of perfection to actually replace somebody in a job. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Let's talk about buying a home for a minute. It can be very stressful and unpredictable, especially these days with mortgage rates going up and down, interest rates going up and down. It's crazy. There's a lot of unpredictability and you want to lessen that anxiety and I recommend you use Rocket Mortgage. Quicken Loans are doing something. The folks at Quicken Loans are doing something about all that anxiety. They're calling it the power buying process. And here's how it works. Step one, answer a few simple questions and then they'll check your credit for pre-qualified approval. Step two, Quicken Loans will verify your income, your assets and your credit in less than 24 hours. Then they will give you a verified approval. That gives you the strength of a cash buyer. And step three, once you're verified, you qualify for their all new exclusive rate shield approval. First, they'll lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop around, look at all the houses you can in 90 days. That's a lot of houses. You could look at a lot of houses in 90 days. Now here is the best part. It's my favorite part personally. If rates go up, your rate stays the same, but if rates go down, your rate also drops. Either way, you are a winner. It's the kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. Okay, I know you want to get started, so get started right now. Even if you haven't gone to look for your first house, you can still get started right now. All you have to do is go to rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage for their support of this episode of Triangulation. I am talking to Joshua Gans, author of Prediction Machines, The Simple Economics of Artificial Intelligence. So, um, as a, this is a great book for any decision makers in a business, small business, large business to decide, oh, you know, I've heard about this AI. Everybody's talking about AI. I, I want it. <laughs> what do you recommend, um, besides reading the book, that uh, those decision makers start to think about um, before uh, the, w the they start to think about and just right. decide whether they're going to introduce AI into their company? Yeah, so the way we do it, and, and we've tried, you know, in contrast to many academic things, we've tried uh, very hard 
provide uh, something that is going to be useful for people. And the way, uh, and we do describe it in the book, but the way we uh, work through these things is saying, well, how is AI, you know, uh, what if you wanted to be proactive about it? What if you wanted to say, well, here is here are the jobs in my organization and here is what people do. How can AI help? How can AI fit in there? And the way we think about it is, well, we this is where we feel the, the, the greatest benefit of thinking of AI as prediction is, is when you can... When you can have a situation where you've got some uncertainty, where people are either guessing or they're avoiding making a decision because there's uncertainty, and you can chop down what you do or what an individual job does into tasks, into decisions, identify that uncertainty, well, there's an opportunity for AI to help. Now, it's not the it's not everything. Uh, it, you have to think about, well, is there going to be the data to develop an AI tool to allow them to uh, resolve this uncertainty or not? Um, but it's surprising to us when we do this with uh, business managers and executives, how often the answer is yes. How often there is a direction to take. We had a situation recently where we had somebody from the security industry uh, in our, uh, you know, was trying to innovate in the security industry and they were in our course. And we posed the same question, you know, where's the uncertainty? Where's the potential waste? And it was like, easy. The big problem this security firm had is false alarms. Situations where there's a fire alarm or a burglary or something like that and there's no such thing. And and basically of all the alarms, something like, like 95% or some absurd number were false. Uh, now, way he saw it is, well, I wonder if there's ways of reducing the number of false alarms. For instance, you know, with a few cameras in a house, can I work out if there's really a burglar or it's just somebody who's forgotten to turn off the alarm? Uh, you know, it, can I, uh, with cameras and other sensors, work out if there's really a fire or there's a, a kitchen smoke or something like that uh, and and trigger a, an alarm that way. And, and basically what he was starting to think about was not just using AI, but also using collecting more data to be able to make those predictions. In other words, it's no use having a camera in a house and linking it up to an alarm if you can't, if you don't have anything automated to look at that camera. <laughs> But once you have a camera, a water sensor, a smoke detector, a car, different air, air filters, all sorts of things, you can take that corpus of knowledge and use AI to get you a much more definitive prediction of when an alarm should sound and when a response is needed. And so I suspect there are a lot of businesses that once you go through that exercise of saying, where's the uncertainty and where's the waste, all of a sudden solutions might present themselves and opportunities might present themselves. Well, one of the biggest uh, examples in recent memory of um, AI going really wrong was the, the, the Tay bot that Microsoft, the chat bot that Microsoft released um, probably yes. too early that, you know, in 24 hours uh, turned into a racist, um, homophobic uh, monster with a picture of a teenage girl as an icon. Um, <laughs> and so, and people said, you know, well, how did they not know that? Because people who had been working with chatbots forever know you, you know, you remove certain words and they just didn't do that. What do you, what do you think right. happened there and what can companies learn from that? Well, I think a few things happened there. I mean, one is that a lot of AIs, uh, the way they are learning is uh, by learning from uh, people by observing people and observing their behavior. So if you observe people and they're making fairly innocuous decisions, uh, that's going to be great. If you're observing people and they are biased in any way, <laughs> and that might be biased in the Kahneman way we talked about earlier, or it might be biased in being uh, uh, sexist or racist or whatever you want to uh, 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 ascribe, the AI is going to reflect that as well. Now, you know, you can look at the Tay thing and say, oh, well, that was 
you know, a wake up call for, you know, we're just going to be unleashing these sort of racist and sexist uh, robots into the world and we shouldn't do that. But the point is, we kind of saw that pretty darn quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, that was put out there. Uh, I think Microsoft's intent was to see how it went in the wild and and to see whether, it, you know, would it develop it? You know, did they did they not anticipate it would develop into a racist, sexist thing? Someone might have thought that was possible, but maybe they thought it wouldn't happen that way. Maybe they thought it'd be more robust than that. And it turned out to be wrong. The lesson to be drawn from that is you can't just roll these out as a magical solution. You know, there's going to be a few problems. You're going to want to test these things. And the struggle you're going to face is you can test it within the work environment where everybody knows to behave themselves. (laughs) And that's not going to get you a real world test. A real world test, people aren't behaving themselves. And so I think what's going to happen is you've got to imagine uh, you've got to test in different environments. (laughs) Um, You've got to, uh, you know, let the middle school (laughs) students at this thing, for instance, Uh, let the worst of the worst at it and see if uh, it it does well. Um, uh, And that is going to slow the proliferation of these things, especially in these sort of human facing AI. And it may delay that entirely. We may not get that at all. Uh, We may just get it put in more safe environments first as a result of that. Uh, but I think that's just par for the course. I mean, if you're asking people to imitate, if, to learn by imitation, you're going to get bad behavior. The same way as you get children getting bad behavior because they imitate parents. Um, you know, it's one of those things uh, that's going to occur. Now, there are a few uh, stop gaps, however. You can uh, delve into the AI and reprogram them in much the way that you can't with children. (laughs) What you can do is you can say, oh, uh, don't be racist. (laughs) And you can program what it means to be racist and constrain the AI not to be that way. Uh, You know, it may crop up in other directions and there may be implicit biases and other things that you can't do. But you can you can solve that pretty darn quickly if you want to. Uh, If you don't want the AI to use bad language, you can tell the AI don't use bad language. Again, much easier than dealing with children and other people. So, uh, you know, I think this is part of the the, the teething problems, as it, uh, as it were. Uh, you know, I think we can thank Microsoft for putting out a nice public example that allows us to write about it in a book and, uh, be, uh, and be a cautionary tale. But, you know, this is going to be happening all over the place and they're not going to be as plainly apparent as this Microsoft example. So what you're saying is that, you know, so say take another example about how, you know, lately we've read that facial recognition um, uh, is, doesn't recognize African-Americans. It, you know, it recognizes right. white guys better than anything else. And that's yes. because they tested it on a bunch of white guys. And so are, right. what you're saying is like, you know, that's horrible, but people saying like, oh, AI is going to be racist. What you're saying is, well, we learned that now and then let's fix it and give it yeah. better data. Exactly. I mean, learn to do it on a more diverse population. Uh, uh, learn, uh, you know, that the AI might have to be of a uh, have a different sort of uh, spectrum uh, of of data that it's uh, getting in order to to properly distinguish things. Uh, and I, I suspect it's not going to just be, uh, you know. It's not. It's not going to just be that. I think those are the like the the easy cases because we can notice them right away. The hard ones are going to be where AIs are doing something and we're trusting them and we're not noticing sort of longer degradations and other things that are going on. Uh, and and you know those are the things that we've got to pay attention to. Um, and and that's essentially the reason why it's hard to get a human out of the picture. Um, Our biggest challenge will be having humans pay attention and be aware uh, and monitoring what uh, AIs or automated things are doing uh, rather than not. I mean, that's been the issue with the safety drivers in the cars. You know, we know what happens. I mean, even when people are driving, 
they don't really want to be driving, uh, let alone when you give them an excuse not to pay attention to the road, <laughs> even for their own safety. So I think, uh, you know, f- you know, those are the, the dramatic examples. Those are things we can probably deal with. But these other sort of slow moving issues, that's going to be harder. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, and we write about this in the book, you know, <laughs> we can only warn people. Uh, you know, statistics can only go so far. It's not going to get everything. It's not a panacea. Uh, so you need to be very, very careful before you put things and start to trust them uh, to make decisions for you. It's interesting. A, a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Virginia Eubanks and she wrote a book called Automating Inequality. And it's about um, all these algorithms that are used in social systems, like in, in welfare systems and across the United States. And um, and you know, they were they they were replacing jobs, but all, replacing that job that you're talking about, like the judgment job, like does this person right. deserve um, to have Medicaid or not? You know, and and her argument was really that um, an algorithm can't decide that. And I thought it would be interesting, you know, after reading your book, but it's very similar. Like the 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 main point is we have humans. We still have to have humans paying attention and our judgment and decision making while can, you know, not be as good as a computer can predict. It's still right. valuable. Yeah, no, I think I think that's the case. And, and there will be a temptation to skimp on that. Uh, situation, especially if it doesn't impact on you. Um, if you're, you know, a large organization, uh, there's this temptation to start treating all people the same way. Um, and, and by treating all people the same way is like, if I've got an algorithm to decide, let them decide it rather than having people uh, manage a case by case situation, which of course is something that doesn't scale in the same way that an automated solution might. So there is that danger. And we're already see- seeing some of that as, you know, Facebook and others uh, are trying to use algorithms uh, to decide on things uh, more, that we're getting some of those, uh, you know, reactions going on there. Uh, and, and less so with the consumer facing part of Facebook, but uh, maybe the, you know, the advertisers and the publishers trying to deal with that, uh, those organizations uh, and some of their rules that are developing that way. Uh, so so, you know, I think I think that we've got a long way to go. I don't think, you know, it's anything really, truly new. It's just a little bit more efficient. You know, we've had bureaucracies and their rules before. Uh, people are always trying to uh, impose rules on us because a rule can apply to everybody, uh, whereas a case-by-case, case, you know, means you have to pay for each case. Uh, so we've had that before, uh, and this is a reflection of it. Now, one can imagine a world in which we do these things better, where we are able to uh, come up with rules that are able to reflect people's cases and and uh, situations better. In other words, judgment is something that we currently have to use each and every day ourselves because we can't articulate what it is. But maybe there will be situations in which we can uh, describe what we do and how we think about things better so that it can be encoded and that human touch can actually scale. Can we do that or not? Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard, to, hard to say. Uh, economists actually tend to be the most pessimistic about being able to, for people to describe what they really want. Um, we tend to, to, to uh, not believe people in terms of what they say or what they think they say they're doing, uh, but how they act. So, you know, one can imagine that this could be a ways off. <laughs> Well, before I let you go, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Creative Destruction Labs. Um, and first, the Creative Destruction itself is an economic concept, which I think is partly what we've been talking about for the last hour. Can yes. you explain uh, briefly what that concept is and then tell me about the, the labs? Yeah, it's one of these terms that uh, came up from uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who was an economist in the early part of uh, last century and uh it's it's a term it's, it's not it's not the sort of term the economists come up with but it's a lovely term creative destruction which describes the process by which we have new innovations come in and they do new things but at the same time they're usually replacing something uh 
else. They're replacing the old thing. Uh, so we have smartphones come in and they replace old mobile phones, which replaced walkie talkies or what have you. Uh, so, you know, with each act of creation is some act of destruction coming with it as well. And so, you know, with AI, uh, there is an element of that. Uh, there's an element of which it's, you know, if it gets self-driving cars, it'll take away the, you know, uh, people's skills in being able to drive or what the value of those skills are. Uh, so that's a process there. Um, we decided to name uh, our lab called the, the Creative Destruction Lab. It's, a, it's not a, a scientific lab. It is a, a seed stage program for uh, encouraging and commercializing uh, science-based technologies. Uh, and we, you know, so we took this name from this sort of economic tradition. But what we're trying to do very much there is uh, solve uh, one of the key sort of leaky bottlenecks that occurred in uh, the generation of new innovations and entrepreneurship, which is, you know, how do we get this corpus of knowledge that is locked up in like universities and get it out into the real world? And what are the barriers to that? And one of the reasons we did that is because if you look at the geography of where innovation occurs, entrepreneurship is concentrated very much like in Silicon Valley and a few other centers, whereas science is all over the place. <laughs> it's occurring everywhere. And so, you know, that already tells us there's some potential issues. And so the the lab, which has now grown to to, to several hundred um, startups coming through it each year, is designed to hit that nexus. And we've located in the business school and we, you know, basically take, you know, every two months we have these sessions, which takes an entire ecosystem, mentors, successful entrepreneurs, scientists, innovators, would-be entrepreneurs, and mashes them into a room together to have an ecosystem in the room. And it turns out, you know, if we solve this geography problem in time and space, we don't have to solve it for very long to start getting things coming out of it. And one of the things that's come out of it is a whole lot of artificial intelligence companies because there was a lot of innovation going on in that field. Well, Joshua Gans, thank you so much for joining us. Joshua Gans is the author of Prediction Machine, The Simple Economics of Artificial Intelligence, which you can see I uh, dog-eared with many post-it notes. <laughs> it has been a pleasure, a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it a lot. All Thanks. Right, take care. Uh, bye. And thank you for listening or watching or, or both, hopefully. Uh, Triangulation records every week uh, on Fridays, usually around 3 p.m. Pacific. And we love it. If you join us, you can watch us live at twit.tv slash live. You can join us in our chat room at irc.twit.tv. Yes, that's, that's the address. Join us live, chat, ask your questions, and be part of the community. You can also subscribe to Triangulation and then listen to it or watch it wherever you want, whenever you want. Just go to twit.tv slash try to find all the ways to subscribe. And I am Megan Maroney. You can find uh, me at Megan Maroney on Twitter. And we'll see you next week on Triangulation. Triangulation.